Hello community. So what do we do today? We do a speed test. I want to show you why we do this video, what you can achieve. So very first element, we just import our JAX and our NumPy, and then we define a function. This is a typical function. I say add x plus x square plus x cube plus x whatever. And then I define my x and x should be, of course, 5,000 times 5,000 array. And I just transfer this number array to a JAX device array with gnp.array. This is it. And then we do a time it. And uh, first I call my function, fn, that's defined, and I apply it on the CPU on my NumPy array. And then I do the same, I call the same function as you can see, the function it stays absolutely the same, I have to do nothing else. And now I just compile it in time with the just in time command with our XLA compiler. And then I feed, of course, the check device array to this. And we not even do it on a TPU, we just do this on a GPU. So now let's have a look at the speed difference we can achieve. First on a CPU, second on a GPU. And then imagine about a TPU. So here we go. The first NumPy on CPU takes about 142 milliseconds per loop. And then I optimized JIT with an XLA compiler version is at 1.3 milliseconds. So from 142 to 1. So, and just for comparison, just to show you that we can also run this with no hardware acceleration. So we are purely CPU bound, especially NumPy and on JIT. And to show you that JIT also run, that JAX also runs on a CPU. Let's do this now with our 5000 times 5000 array on a CPU, where you would expect, well, how could there be some acceleration. Well, it all depends on the compiler. So the first one gives us 181 milliseconds and the JAX with XLA compiler gives us about 20 milliseconds, I guess 18.3 milliseconds. Last time we talked about the new infrastructure, the cloud infrastructure you will encounter in 2023 when you do your ML task execution. We talked about the Google TPU version 4, and we talked about the new Hopper generation of NVIDIA's H100 that you will encounter in cloud infrastructure, hardware infrastructure. Now, the main question is, do we need new code for this? Now, the answer depends. What I specifically looking for while executing and training my ML job is scaling. I want to scale it as high as possible. I want to have the maximum speed I can afford financially. I want to have low memory. I want to have low memory cost. And in general, I want low cost for my training in the cloud. So these are my four parameters. High scaling, huge speed improvements, low memory and lower cost. Now, if you want to have a slow incremental innovation, you stay with TensorFlow 2, you stay with your PyTorch implementation beautifully. And remember last time we talked about the XLA compiler functionality that we discovered that uh, NVIDIA and Google have a cooperation on this so that this XLA compiler will run, it is running on TPUs, on GPUs from Google Hopper architecture. And you see here, this with this blue arrow, that we are a little bit more away from the pure compiler, so from the pure programming language transfer to the machine code. But if we want to take more risk and we want to apply maybe actual research, we have here a new programming language. This is a little bit closer. You see it here on the blue indicator, closer to the compiler. This is a little bit farther away. But this is high risk. It is still uh, by Google a research project, but it definitely changed the way I code today. And why? I will show you in a second because it scales automatically. The speed improvements are significant. I use less memory and the costs are almost cut in half. So now, if we have a wish list, 
when we say, hey, we have a new programming language, what do I want, what I need, what should be the functionality? At first, remember when we do all the loss function, we calculate the loss function, we calculate backpropagation, we calculate I don't know how many functional parameters. The new language should strictly focus on function, on function transformation. Because we don't want to solve, for example, a loss equation, not scalar point by point by point. We calculate it like we do it today with PyTorch and TensorFlow. But what we want, we want a higher level solver. We want to have a solver that is operating on a function level so that we have, for example, uh, if you have uh, a vector field or if you have a function, then automatically, if you want to calculate the change of the system, the change of the weights in a neural network, or the change of adaptation or the change of superfluids. You want to have a functional level uh, solver that does not give you point by point on a scalar vector field, on a scalar field, but you want to have on a functional level, you want to have a complete level and an analytical solution. Now, second point, uh, is, of course, since the hardware is not optimized for an XLA, for an accelerated uh, linear algebra compiler, because we've seen that the TensorFlow course, no, that the Tensor course in the Harper architecture of NVIDIA GPU are Tensor cores purely. So mathematic uh, matrix multiplication, Tensor multiplication, and also the TPU from Google, the Tensor processing unit itself is based on Tensor. So we want linear algebra based compiler functionality here. And we want to have an auto XLA compiler where I can feed in my Python functions. I write everything in Python and it's automatically compiled for me. And not just automatically, but you have a just in, just in time uh, into an XLA optimized kernel and it runs fast and it scales automatically. Now for scaling, another point is important. You want to have a vectorization and a parallelization that is also in the best way automated. So you don't have to care about this. So parallel distributed computing, let's call this. And for scaling, let's say, if you have on Google Colab, you already have, if you switch to a hardware accelerator TPU, you automatically have eight XLA devices free of charge, tried out, but you scale up if you pay for Google Cloud, of course. Uh, the TPU part version four has 4,092 cores. So you can really scale up your performance of your system. And what we need for all of this, and this is if you want the mindset for me as a programmer, I have to change how I do things, how I write code, is a Lego principles. You know these little plastic stones, Lego, you can put them one on the top and you can build black, blue stones and, and towers and autos and I don't know, a fire brigade and whatever. And those Lego pieces you can compose them in different ways to build new structures. And we want the same on our objects. Our objects here, are of course, functions, pure functions. And we want to have a composable functional level here where we can build new structure out of this uh, predefined pure function that we are programming in. And another uh, condition, let's call it, is it has to be stateless. Now, stateless has a lot of meaning. What I mean, or what, what is from the hardware side, is imagine you have NumPy and you have a CPU core and you have an ND array, and this array is calculated on one core. Now, this one core, of course, you do the calculation and then, or you do uh, whatever, uh, you have a, what do I, well, I don't know, an NN model. And you, in this uh, neural network model, you have the weights of all the different layers and the different neurons. And these are data. And these data are part of, in TensorFlow and in PyTorch, part of your model. You have the data inherent in your model. So this means you have a stateful, if you want, state here in your core. But if we say now, hey, we want to have scalable and uh, automatically do it, then we call it stateless. Stateless equals, in the very simple explanation, they do not save data. They do not keep something that they have just pro, uh, calculated, processed, 
it's already swapped out completely. Our cores are always empty, free, clean, ready for the next calculation. Why? Because if you have four, eight or 4,000 cores, you, you do not have somebody who supervises it. Ah, which kind of data, where are we here in first core, in the second core, what are the dependencies, what are the time scaling? My goodness, no, you have stateless, you do your calculation per core, you have all the input, it is calculated on the core and the result goes out with the output of the core and the core itself is empty, clean, beautiful. It's a pure compute engine, but it does not save stores data where you have been calculated in the past, some parameters, no, everything is gone with the output. And if you start new, it is brand new and empty. And this is if you have 4,000 of these cores, this is exactly what you want. You want to have a free, empty, clean sheet where you start your computation. So beautiful. Just to show you how big those things are, here is from the live stream from Google Cloud Next 2022. Here is the size, the pure size of a TPU board. And I think, my goodness, it's quite large. And uh, yeah, I mean, the idea that Google have is, of course, uh, you do not have to think anything anymore about hardware specifications. This is last generation cloud thinking. I like this wording. So they say you just specify your workload, your model, your training time. They will recommend a configuration in the cloud. They will configure it for you and they place the best option for you based on the price point you accepted to pay on the performance you want for a specific model, training, inference whatsoever, and the scaling that you need, given, of course, your financial resources. So you see here in this picture here, you have the cooling pipes for your four TPUs. It's amazing they have chilled water for the cooling, and this is quite some huge TPU board. I never thought that it would be that, that big, but amazing. And what they say? Uh, we know that these automated adaptive decisions deliver lower cost, more performance, higher rel reliability. Yeah, if somebody knows how to tune and optimize a cloud infrastructure from Google, I hope it is Google itself. And they predict that over half of the cloud infrastructure decisions will be automated based on an organization's usage pattern. So welcome to AI. Just to give you an idea and, and to have here a clear view, a meta view, where is this new programming language? And you know now that this is JAX, how is it situated and, and where it integrates? Now, JAX is, if you want, pure uh, auto differentiation engines and those famous XLA compiler functionality. So for everything else, you need to rely on other things. For example, there's no JAX data pipeline in the classical sense. So you take TensorFlow, you have your data loader, your data pipelines, whatever you prefer, and you just prepare the data for JAX. JAX is not, and I will show you in a second, uh, not a classical number array, but you have a device specific array or a shared array. And then when JAX is done, you have a lot of libraries already developed for you that are based on JAX. And you see that this, this last two digit A and X, you will find this here with flags, optax. And if you're working on neural networks, like I do, there's this beautiful library based on JAX for neural network, and it's called Flax. Great, congratulations. Now, there's also a library if you want to have your optimizers. It's called Optex. And also, if you want to define your loss function for your specific models, they are already, already done for you. All the models are available for you, and it's called Optex, this library. And if you are like I, also working on graph neural networks, you have uh, specialized domain knowledge that is implemented in the library, and this is Giraffe. I did a video about half a year ago on Giraffe. So this is if you are on graph neural networks, you're working over there and you're looking for a specific training functionalities. This is already implemented in JAX in this specific library for GNNs. Now, the nice thing is, and this is what I want to show you in the maybe in the next video, 
or a little bit later on, is you can export your models. You know from TensorFlow that you can save your model, you can save the state of the model, you can write everything to the cloud, to your local disk, and whenever you need the model again with the trained weights, you just say load the model. And here we have a beautiful, uh, let's call it a pipeline, a model export library. It's called JAX to TensorFlow, and this saves the model in TensorFlow. So you also have this functionality that you have here, your saved converted TensorFlow model. Yeah, then you have specific libraries for checkpoint, matrix, testing, and whatsoever. But this is not the point I wanted to show you. I just wanted to show you that JAX in itself is um, a research topic that has quite a lot of activities going on right now in November 2022. When I record this video, you see the neural network libraries that are based on JAX. And here I have this resource, the GitHub from Awesome Jacks. I recommend this to you. I'll leave you the link in the description of this video. This is here a photo of the GitHub documentary. You have Flex, Haiku, this is from DeepMind, of course, also Google. Then you have Tracks, then Giraffe for Lightwave Graph Neural Network Libraries. Uh, Hugging Face itself is a little bit different. Yes, Equinox, of course. And then here for gradient processing and optimization library on JAX, you have Optex, I just showed you. And then the list goes on and on and on for your specific. This is just here for neural network libraries that are already have all the modules and all the classes for you if you go on and program in JAX. So you have the, all your convolutional network already ready for you just to execute the, the module command. So this is really nice. How you can utilize the new cloud infrastructure that you will experience in 2023. What is their compiler they are running with, the machine code they are implementing it, how are they optimized, and if you code which coding system, which programming language I think I'm going to use for my particular task, machine learning, NLP task, vision task, what I'm going to use and I think for me, if I look for speed, if I look for scalability, if I look for lower cost, and also if I look for lower critical memory utilization, I will go with JAX. I hope you enjoyed a little bit of this video and I see you in the next one.